Good morning, Hope River Church family, and happy Palm Sunday. Is it happy Palm Sunday or Merry Palm Sunday or whatever it's supposed to be? It's Palm Sunday, and I'm glad you're here this morning. We can worship that, celebrate that together. Normally, one of the guys in our church, John, has beautiful decorations done to help us prepare and focus and center on that. And we're not going to let the absence of those this morning distract us because today is Palm Sunday, and I'm excited that you're here. So let's start off by praying together. God, uh, on this Sunday when we celebrate your triumphal entry into Jerusalem, God, I pray that um, you would allow us to focus in on you and the meaning behind this day. And as we wrap up our 40 days of prayer, may this be a meaningful time for us to, to learn more about how our prayer can be more dynamic and more powerful. God, thanks for being here with us already. I just pray that... Um, we'd be able to focus in on you and honor you today. Amen. Well, again, it's Palm Sunday. It's the Sunday when we focus on Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And I've got a familiar friend who's going to read the passage and then uh, share an added bonus for all of us this morning. Hi, church. It's Palm Sunday. And today I wanted to read to you out of the book of Luke. It's chapter 19, and I'm going to pick up at verse 30 and read through 44. It's the triumphal entry. Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you and enter it. You will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're untying it, tell him the Lord has need of it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as they were told. As they were untying the colt, the owner asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When they came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd and the disciples began joyfully praising God with loud voices for all the miracles that they have seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. As they approached Jerusalem, they saw the city and he wept over it. And he said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and all of your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize at the time of God's coming to you. So, all these people that were on the road, the feast of Passover, the celebration had just ended, but they were still all together. And while they were together, they had heard and they were talking about how Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. They had also heard that Jesus was beginning his journey to Jerusalem. So as they were following him, they were screaming and yelling and praising his name and throwing their coats on the ground as if he was a king entering this kingdom. And the crazy thing is, these people, if they did not see Jesus do these miracles firsthand, if they had not heard his teaching firsthand, they did know somebody who did if they would have been paying attention, they would have realized that Jesus was not their earthly king, but he was their savior, he was their salvation. I'm gonna go back and I wanna read Luke 19, 41 and 42. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. You know, I pray in these days as things are going on, 
that your eyes would be open, that you would know where to look for and find the peace and find hope. And as I'm leaving you today, I'm gonna to step out of the frame and I wanna to sing to you some lyrics to a new song by Matthew West. But I wanna step out of the frame because I want you not to focus on me, but I want you to focus on the cross that's behind me. I want you to focus on who Jesus is in your life. And I'm believing and trusting that this song will be our prayer of thanksgiving and praise to him. If I were you, I would have given up on me by now. I would have labeled me a lost cause, cause I feel like I'm a lost cause. If I were you, I would have turned around and walked away. I would have labeled me beyond repair, cause I feel that I'm beyond repair. But somehow you don't see me like you do. Somehow you're still here. I used to hide every time I thought I let you down. I always thought I had to earn my way, but I'm learning you don't work that way. Cause somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still here. You're the God who stays. You're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands with wide open arms. And you tell me nothing I have ever done can separate my heart from the God who stays. My shame can't separate my guilt, can't separate my past, can't separate i'm yours forever my sin can't separate my scars can't separate my failures can't separate i'm yours forever no enemy can separate no power of hell can take away your love for me will never change i'm yours forever because you're the god who stays you're the god who stays you're the one who runs in my direction when the whole world walks away you're the god who stands with wide open arms and you tell me nothing I have ever done can separate my heart from the God who stays. You're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands with wide open arms. And you tell me nothing I have ever done Could separate my heart from the God who stays God, I thank you that you haven't given up on us And I thank you that we are just entering What we would call Holy Week And as we spend time this week in your word We will see how Jesus laid his life down for us That he could be our sacrifice Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. And God, we just give you glory. Amen. Gary, thank you for sharing with us. I really appreciate you doing that for us this morning. You know, one of the things that Gary read in that passage was that they shouted out Hosanna. It's a, a word that means the one who saves. It's about God saving. It's a plea on their behalf, asking Jesus, in this case, to, to come save them. Words matter. Those are the words that they were shouting. And words matter for us, too. In fact, I'm thinking of a word right now that is one of my least favorite words to hear. If you've got a guess, go ahead and throw it in the chat. Turn to the person beside you in your living room, or if you're, if you're still laying in bed and watching it on a phone. What's the, what do you think is one of my least favorite words to hear? 
if you've thrown that in the chat section there, if you've guessed for someone in the room there with you, I'll tell you, one of the least favorite words for me to ever have to hear is the word no. I don't like hearing the word no, and I'm going to guess that some of you might have guessed that right because you don't like hearing the word no either. And it's this corona era time that we're living in, it just seems like the word no is pretty prevalent. Can I go to work? No. In fact, we're going to lay you off right now. Can I go hang out with my friends? No. Not allowed to leave the house. Can I go outside? Well, no, because apparently now you can't even go outside without wearing some kind of a mask. Can I buy three packages of toilet paper? No. No, you're only allowed to have two, if you can even find two. None of us like to hear no. Whether we're two or 92, we just don't like to hear that. Today we're finishing up our 40 days of prayer. And as we finish this up, if you've been working through your prayer journal, I would encourage you to finish out strong. The small group materials that start each week, at the beginning of each week in your journal, these can be found on a playlist right here on our YouTube channel. In fact, this week's teaching from Pastor Rick Warren at Saddleback Church, that we would use in our small group videos, it's called How to Pray in a Crisis very appropriate for us and timely for us this week. So I would encourage you to, to watch that video, whether you have a journal to follow along with or not. As we finish out this series on the 40 days of prayer, I want to talk about that word no when it comes to our prayer time. I mean, what do we do when God says no? We've looked at scriptures that talk about we don't have because we don't ask, that God wants us to engage with him. And that's Part of how he chooses to interact with us and respond in this world is through our prayers. So sometimes we don't have because we haven't asked. And we look at scriptures that say that if we ask anything in his name, he will, it'll be done for us. And we talked about, you know, how it's about being in his name. It's about lining up with his purpose and his will. But what do you do when you're making the ask? What do you do when it's something that certainly would line up with God's plan? What do you do when God says no? I read a book probably 20 years ago written by a Christian author that kind of answered this question and he proposed at least three different reasons why God might say no. First of all, the request might be wrong. See, God's not going to give us things that would ultimately be bad for us. Picture a child. Picture a child coming to its parent and saying, can I have a tarantula? The answer is no. You're not bringing a poisonous spider into my house that will get out of its cage during the night and come over and kill us all. No, we're not doing that. Or imagine your 13-year-old daughter comes to you and she asks you, Dad, can I lie about my age and create an online profile on a dating site? I just want to be able to connect with people and make some friends and maybe go hang out with those people that I meet online sometime. No, 13-year-old daughter, you're not doing that. That's just a bad, bad idea. It's a horrible plan. And I know you don't understand right now, but no, the answer is no. I love you too much to say yes. And God sometimes looks at us and says, no. The request is wrong. I've got something far better for you. I love you way too much, God would say. I love you way too much to say yes. And sometimes God says no because the request is just not right, even if we don't understand it right now. Sometimes God says no because we need to mature. God's not giving us, going to give us something that we're not ready for. Imagine your five-year-old child comes to you and says, can I have that new iPhone with unlimited data and no parental controls? Well, the answer is no. You're not ready for that yet. What we did in our family is we got our daughter an iPod. 
and she uses the iPod and we told her, you know, if you can show us that you can handle not being glued to it all the time, if you can handle gaming and internet access with parental controls, if you can take care of it and not leave it outside in the rain, then if you can show us that you can handle that, then, then as you mature, then we'll discuss the phone. Probably not the thousand dollar iPhone, but we'll discuss a phone for you when the timing is right, or when the situation is right, because right now you're not mature enough for that. And sometimes God looks at us and says, you know what? That's a great request, but I'm just not ready for it yet. You're just not ready where you need to be for me to answer that request. And sometimes he just needs us to mature. Sometimes it's not about the, the request or even us. It's about the timing. And the timing is wrong. So sometimes God says no because the timing isn't right. God's not going to say yes when the timing is wrong. It might be like your teen child coming to you right now and saying, hey, can I go over to my friend's house and hang out? Um, No. Do you understand what travel ban means? Do you know what stay at home means? It means you're not going to your friend's house. It means you have to wait. It has nothing to do with you not being mature enough to, to handle going over to your friend's house. That's a very appropriate request, and, and you can handle it. Your friend can handle it. There's no, no problems with any of that. It's just that the timing is not right. So you have to wait. I don't like it. When God tells me to wait, I don't like it when he says, be patient, because I'm not always the most patient person. So when God says, wait, sometimes it's really hard for me to hear, because I don't want him to say no, because the timing isn't right. Well, God sometimes says no, but how do we deal with that then? Jesus serves as the example for every part of life. And, and if we only had a situation in Scripture where Jesus was told no. We can see how he deals with it and how he interacts with God in that no. Ah, but we do. We do from this last week of Jesus' life that we commemorate this week. We have a, a scripture in Mark 14. Go ahead and get your Bibles out and turn to Mark 14. Because in there we read a passage about submission. When God told Jesus uh, no. Before I read that passage though, Aaron and Fawn are going to lead us in a song that sets up this scripture about surrender. It's a song about surrender. Surrender. It's a song about giving God our heart. in that song. I appreciate you ladies doing that for us. You know, Mark 14, just as that song was a song of surrender, this is the passage of surrender. And in Mark 14, I'm going to start reading at verse 32. 
and we read this. And he came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass by. Verse 36, And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Now, when we look at this passage from Jesus' life, we can learn how to deal with those times when God says no to us by following the example of Jesus. First thing is this. Like Jesus, we need to believe in God's ability. In verse 36 there, he said, all things are possible for you. Jesus believed that, that God could do anything. Do you believe that? I mean, what's the, what's the hardest thing you're dealing with in life right now? Do you think God can handle that? Do you think God's big enough to deal with your biggest problem? Or do you think it's too much for him? I mean, certainly globally, right now we're just surrounded by the struggles of the coronavirus and the economic struggles that that's creating as well. But in some places, I was talking to my daughter the other day, like in Uganda where she used to be a missionary, um, their concern there is, is certainly the, the virus, but their concern there is food storage, food um, shortage, and that people in their, in their country might starve to death during this time. What is it for you, personally? What's that big issue right now? Maybe it's protection from the virus. Maybe it's some relational crisis that you're in. I saw the other day that um, reports of domestic abuse have escalated exponentially right now across the country as we're cooped up in our homes and, and maybe maybe your family's just dealing with some added tension right now and some of those relational struggles in your family are, are a big big issue right now or, or maybe it's loneliness even as a church you know we're, we're struggling to find ways that we can keep connected to each other and we're struggling to find ways that we can serve in our community and we're just looking and looking for ways to just connect with one another and serve each other and serve our community. What's that area that for you is that area that you're struggling most with right now? And the question is, do you believe in God's ability to deal with this? Do you think he can help? Jesus did. He said, God, everything is possible for you. He's big enough to handle whatever that problem is. So like Jesus, we need to believe in God's ability. Secondly, then, we need to make our request known. That verse said that Jesus prayed, remove this cup from me. Um, this, this cup of, of pain and suffering and death that he was going to have to endure. He's like, God, can you replace it with a cup of happiness and joy or something different? You know, remove this from me if at all possible. So think about the biggest thing you're dealing with. Jesus made his request known to God. He said, God, please help me with this. And we need to make our request known to him as well. Certainly believing he can deal with it is then going to him and talking to him about that struggle that we're having, making our requests known to him. You know, the third thing that Jesus does here is he submits to God's plan. He says in this verse, Yet not what I will, but what you will. In the King James it says, Not my will, but thine be done. That word there in the New American Standard, yet not what I will, says yet. That word, it's used to show a contrast or a difference. It could be said on the other hand. So you've got this situation, and then there's this situation. And that's what Jesus is in. He's in that place of saying, not my will, but yours be done on the other hand. For example, today for lunch, you have two options. You can either cook or prepare your lunch, or you can get takeout. The option of going to a restaurant is not out there anymore, so those are your two options. You can either prepare your lunch, or you can get takeout. 
And if you don't prepare it, you're going to have to get takeout. If you prepare it, then you don't need takeout. It's, it's a dichotomy. It's a, it's a binary choice. Either this one or this one. I would suggest that that phrase, not what I want, not what I will, but what you will, should be a part of every prayer we pray. That doesn't have to be that exact language. It's not some formula that we have to use. But it's about us saying, God, it's not what I want. It's what you want that I want done in my life. It's about submitting to him, submitting to God's plan. God, help me get that promotion. But if you have something better or different for me, I'll be okay with that too. God, help me to get into that first college of my choice. But God, if you have a different plan for me to do something different, I'll be okay with that too. God, help us to get married. But, but God, if you have a different Mr. or Miss Wright for me, or if you have a different plan for me just to stay single, God, I'll, I'll be okay with that too. God, protect me and my family from the COVID-19 virus. But God, if that's not your plan, I'll be okay with that too. It, it, it's about surrender. It's about making our request known, but then it's saying like Jesus did, on the one hand, I don't want to die, but yet at the same time, Jesus, I'll say, or God, I'll say whatever you want. It's about submission. It's about surrender. Remember last week, we talked about that a little bit too. We talked about how one of the words in the, in the Hebrew meant to, to fold the bird's wings to a position of surrender. That's what it's talking about. We have a West Highland White Terrier. His name is McDuff. When we got McDuff, I read in a book that said that uh, you, you, as the owner, should take your puppy and, and pin it down to the ground, playfully and gently, of course. And then, of course, the dog will struggle and it will fight. But then they said it will, at one point, stop fighting you and surrender. And at that point, you, you let the dog go and let it go on and play. And then maybe later that day or the next day, you take the dog and you pin it down again and it will fight and then it will eventually surrender. It's about you teaching the dog who the, the alpha male is in your pack, in your family. It's about that dog choosing to surrender to you. And that's what we're talking about with us and God. It's about saying, you know what, God, I'm not in charge of my life. I surrender. I surrender to you, God. You are the one I want to be in charge of my life. On one hand, this is what I want, God. But on the other hand, I'm surrendering to you. And whatever you say is best. So when God does say no, and we surrender to him, we have to, fourthly then, rely on God's help to deal with that no answer. To know that his help, his, his support, his grace is, is sufficient. It's enough for us. Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, was writing to a church in Corinth. And he had this struggle that he was dealing with. We don't know exactly what it was. But we pick up his, his struggle in this conversation. And it's in 2 Corinthians 18, or I'm sorry, 12, verse 8. And it says this. Concerning this, whatever this struggle was, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will boast about my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, and with difficulties. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. God will help us to deal with those no's and give us the ability to endure and to make it in my family, there are certain things that we typically do that we can't be doing right now. My youngest daughter likes to go out for iced coffee with one of her with one of her buddies, and uh, she and her friend go to Dunkin' Donuts and they do their coffee thing. And we can't be doing that right now, obviously. So as a family, we're playing way more board games than usual. We've got out the Wii, and we're playing party games on the Wii as a family together. We're cooking and baking together, trying to gain our COVID-19. Uh, we're just doing things different to try to help out, to try to make it okay during this struggling time. And to me, that's kind of what God does too. 
He says, I, I know you thought that this was the right thing, but I'm saying no. And I know you won't understand right now. That's okay. I just need you to trust me. And I will help you through that no. My grace is sufficient for you. For, he says, the power is perfected in your weakness. So as, you, as I say no to you and you struggle with that, just trust me that I know what I'm doing. And to me, that's kind of the, the key word in all of this. When God says no to us, it's about trusting him and relying on him. And knowing that he's got our best interest at heart. And knowing that he loves us. Because of that, we can trust him. Let me pray for us. God, I don't know what everybody's dealing with today in their own personal lives. I know that we as a nation are dealing with the struggle of the coronavirus. And we're dealing with the economic struggles from that as well. I know that we've got healthcare workers not just in our country, but all over the world, who are dealing with frontline struggles of dealing with the patients who have it. And we know that there are loved ones and families who are dealing with the loss of people who have, who have succumbed to it. So, Lord, there's all kinds of needs that we have in our lives. But, Lord, I also know that there are other needs that we have in our individual lives as well. And, God, I, I would just pray that collectively, whatever that biggest issue is that we have right now, that we would lift that up to you and that we would just seek your help. And God, uh, we're going to present that request to you and, and trust you. And we're going to share with you what we think is the right thing and what we want. But yet, God, we're also going to say it's not about what we want. It's about what you want. So God, in our deepest struggle right now, we're choosing to surrender to you. We're choosing to say that you do what's right and we will trust you. And God, I pray that your grace would be sufficient for us, that you would help us in our weaknesses, and that you would help us to trust you. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Well, I'm glad you joined us today. Just um, a couple quick things before we before we go finish today. Five quick, ooh, sorry, five quick things. First, Hope River Kids. Uh, at 10.45 this morning, you're going to do your, your service. Uh, you're, you're teaching online with Mr. Steve, so uh, it's on a different video there. So stay tuned on the YouTube channel and then check out that video. Secondly, church, I'm going to ask you this week to connect with two people from our church, people that you haven't been connecting with so far during this coronavirus. Connect with two people this week and just check on them and make sure they're doing okay. Third announcement is concerning prayer requests. There is a link in the description of our video uh, for today. You can click on that and submit prayer requests. We've got people in our church, including myself, who would love to be praying for you. If it's something you want a group of people to pray for, just share that with me. If it's confidential, there's a way to mark it that way, confidential, and that'll just be between us, and I won't share that with anybody else. But I would encourage you to use that as a way to share your prayer requests with us. Um, fourth, uh, giving. I just want to thank those of you who have been so faithful in your support to this church. We're doing ministry in different ways, and we're trying to serve people in different ways right now, and, and your support helps make that possible. So thank you for those of you who are giving online or, or sending it to our P.O. box. The, the directions for that are also uh, in the video description for today. But just thank you so much. It's making a difference. And lastly, Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday is next Sunday. And Hope River Church family, we've prepared, we're preparing something um, that's going to be a different and exciting thing for us for next Sunday. We're preparing some bags that will be available to each of our church families and that we want you to have. We'll get them to you this week that will be used as a part of our service that Sunday. If you're living in the Jersey Shore area and you're not a part of a regular church family, please get in touch with me. All of our contact stuff is in the, is in the description as well. Get in touch with me and I'd love to get you one of those bags for next Sunday as well. Now, if you're not in the region here, um, next Sunday, part of what we're going to be doing is taking communion together. So I would encourage you to find some bread or a cracker, some juice or even a grape, so that in, in your home there next Sunday, you can take communion as well. Now, if you're in the region and you get a bag, all the stuff will be in there for you. But if you're not in our region, I want you to be prepared for that as well. Next Sunday, it's Easter Sunday, and we're going to celebrate the fact that he is risen. So I pray that this will be a great Holy Week for you, that it will be a meaningful time for you, and I'll see you next Sunday for Easter Sunday. 
Don't forget Hope River Kids. It's coming up next. <laughs>